welcome and thank you so much for watching. I'm Orion Kelly, that autistic guy. I'm all about providing validation and support for autistic people and their loved ones. Now, it's another collaboration video and I have got another incredible autistic content creator for you to meet. Maybe you've already checked out her channel, Proudly Autistic on YouTube. Late diagnosed autistic woman, Karen. Let's do this, my friends. Thank you so much for being here, Karen. Good to see you. Thank you for having hey, me today. I appreciate it. I, uh, I appreciate you being here and taking up your time. And I'm excited because hopefully we can hear a story that resonates with other you know, late diagnosed autistic people. And I think this is the best part of doing these videos. I love to hear people's stories and you know, your, your content is phenomenal and focused and really, really bang on uh, content. But this might be a bit different to the regular stuff because we actually get to dig deep into your story, Karen. So uh, I hope you strapped yourself in. I hope you're ready to rock. <laughs> I hope so. I'll do my best. Proudly autistic, right? So that, that's obviously mm -hmm. the name, but you know, yes. uh, presumably that's something you've worked towards that hasn't just happened. So let's go right back, my friend. Uh, tell us a bit about you know, little Karen, when it, uh, the upbringing. Mm -hmm. How? Let's start at the start here. You, you so were you, you weren't diagnosed as a child. Uh, that from from knowing you, I know, I know that's the case. So mm -hmm. that sounds similar to my story, to a lot of people's mm -hmm. stories. Let's start at the start. Talk us through uh, little Karen. Okay, well, little Karen, that's a little tough. Um, I so I wasn't diagnosed until age forty. So. Going to little Karen, I didn't know I was autistic and I grew up in an environment that was pretty chaotic. I have a narcissistic parent. So when you have a narcissistic parent, everything is about them. It's all about making them happy, however they feel in that moment. And you become disconnected with who you are and your own feelings, your emotions, desires, all that. Everything has to be adjusted to reflect the needs of the narcissist. So if, for example, you have a bad day and you try to express that, I, my parent would tell me, oh, well, you must have a mental illness because you're sad. Maybe we need to check you out. If you can't get a handle of that, I don't know what's going to happen to you as an adult. So there was a lot of shame around having emotions to the point where I just ceased to have any emotions, right? So you grow up in this environment, again, not only with the narcissistic behavior, but a lot of unease, I guess would be a, per, a good way to say it. Just a lot of emotion, yelling, things like that, where it could be very scary. Now, in retrospect, I could look at that, especially as an autistic person, that this experience was probably worse for me. It's, it's not good for anyone to be raised in that environment, but because I was autistic and again, all those emotions, those scary things that were going on and not quite knowing how to process all that and not having an outlet of anyone telling me, you know, Karen, this isn't normal. This isn't okay. And I would later find that some of my family members were concerned about what was happening, but they didn't know how to help. And their concern was the more that they pushed and maybe tried to help, the less access they would have to me. So they felt, well, maybe we should tolerate this to some extent, just so that they could still have access and be able to monitor the situation to, to the degree that they could. And so that's what I was raised in. I, at around age 10, my parent moved me away. Well, my parents, we moved away out of state halfway across the country from my whole support network. So that was all my aunts, uncles, cousins, and especially as an autistic person, when we don't have a lot of friends, our, our family is means everything to us. And all my cousins, they were my age. Those were my only real friends. And all of a sudden they were halfway across the country from me. And of course, this was all to isolate. 
us uh, and to not only limit the access from my relatives who, again, were really trying to get overly involved in the situation, but for control. My parent wanted to have ultimate control. So I was very isolated. I lived on several acres of land. I didn't really have any friends and I pulled really inward. And so for the longest time, especially in retrospect, autism really wasn't, I wasn't really aware that autism could even be a thing for me. I just assumed that it had to do with my upbringing, that of course I'd have trouble making friends. And of course I'd have some psychological challenges and everything because of what had happened in the past. So it didn't occur to me that I could be autistic. You know what, so let, me, let me say something, Karen. Mm -hmm. You know, that resonates so deeply and here's why, right? Here's why. Mm -hmm. um, I find a lot of late diagnosed autistic people um, have, have this kind of discovery later in life of what was clearly um, hidden autistic mm -hmm. traits. Um, and, and hearing you, it's, I can't tell you it's how similar it is. It must be resonating with others. Like, for example, I was in a family that moved around a lot. Now, from my point of view, I, I think it, in retrospect it was probably um, – you know, my parents' inability to um, maintain stable employment. That could be the case. I don't know. Um, I know I, don't, I wouldn't be well, you know, well-versed to the mainstream workplaces. Um, I am one of those kind of people. I get a job and I'm already thinking about what, I, what should I do next. Mm -hmm. um, but, so the, but the moving is a big thing for me. It resonated with me when you said it. I, I had to go through, you know, more moves because being the eldest, more moves than the rest of my family. Um, and as a result, you know, interstate, new, new schools, you know. Um, and even when we were settled, when we finally kind of settled in one suburb, ironically, my parents are still in that suburb. It's like, thanks so much for, you know, like, do it now. Um, even in the same suburb, I went to high school. So I started in one high school and I went to another one. I finished in another one. Um, and there's different reasons for that. But, you know, those you have to look back and go, oh, my God, all these hidden Autistic traits were made even harder to find because you could just say, well, Ryan struggles to make friends because he's moved a lot or he's changed high school again or he's just a bad person, um, you know, he's a bad egg in the family or, or whatever. And, and then you start, to, you start to experience, you know, um, the, the kind of – it's almost like a, you're gaslighting yourself um, mm -hmm. a, with regards to that. I wanted to ask you about, about school and, and friends because – so. Like we have, you know, we know we know what it's like to have a kid, right? So we these days, you could pretty much rely safely, at least in Australia, can't speak on your behalf, of schools at least raising things, right? Back in the day when we were in school, I know school raising. Oh, I think you could, could be autistic. Like this is not going to happen. <laughs> um, but that happens these days. Family, friends, schools, doctors, things. You know, at least try to raise things in a proactive or positive way. And that isn't the experience, you know, growing up. And you've talked about how they viewed you. How did you, how did you find the, so the family experience is one. How did you find the schooling, the friend world growing up? I wouldn't even, well, I struggled to make friends, but for a large part, I'd say it wasn't until I was maybe a teenager, middle school, that I even cared about having friends. So for a long time, I was pretty much in my own world, which to your point should have raised flags with the educators of, hmm, you know, maybe we need to look into this because <laughs> I was just very inward and I was happy with that. My nose was always in a book or something like that. So, so again, that should have raised flags. Now, when I was older, definitely by teen years, I, it wasn't so much that I knew I was different, but I wished I could participate in things that my peers were participating in, where they were starting to date and they had friends, more friends, they seemed more popular, all these things. And it just wasn't working out for me. Again, it wasn't that I felt like I was different or maybe that I was doing something wrong. It just wasn't happening for me. And I think part of it, I just assumed, oh, well, I must just be shy. And it's been in the past 10 years or so that I've realized I'm not shy at all. Obviously, I'm out here doing this. I'm not shy. But I think when you are autistic and when you struggle so much, that seems to be the messaging. Well, you just must be shy and introverted. So I just assumed that was the reason I had so many struggles. And 
when I got into high school, so about ninth grade, uh, I, the situation did become a little more desperate for me. I was incredibly lonely and I recognized that I had to figure out how to make friends to the point that I was actually making deals with myself where it was like, I need to make so maybe 10 friends in the next year, or maybe I need to reconsider, you know, whether I continue on if you catch what I mean. So it was a pretty intense struggle during high school. And as part of that, I forced myself into sports. I started on the swim team, had never swam competitively before, didn't know half the strokes, and I just figured it out because I knew I had to be part of something. I knew I had to interact and be social and yeah, figure it out because if I didn't, I didn't like that outcome. And uh, yeah, so that's how I kind of struggled through my yeah. teen years. Um, yeah, as late diagnosed autistic people, I reckon definitely, you know, presumably late diagnosed autistic women. I, I think that would have to resonate and it's a great difference because what you're going through in high school, you know, is must be such a resonating feeling for other other women. And I, I only say that because it, it's not especially resonating with me, as in I couldn't care less if I did or didn't have friends. Um, <laughs> uh, being an being an autistic guy, but I, I I can absolutely see you know being a woman mm -hmm. and the idea of being a teenage you know a teenager mm -hmm. bloody bloody horrible anyway. But it is probably important for some sort of social. Um, connection, you know, some sort of social energy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and also, you're way more judged than I would have been if I had no friends and was quiet, right? Like, I'm just a, I'm just a teenage guy. That's how, that's how teenage boys are, right? We're just mm -hmm. quiet. You know? um, and, it, you know, that's what they say. Um, so I can imagine, uh, the, you know, the, the strain and stress of a teenage girl needing to try to find a group or fit in or find somewhere, yeah. so, find someone, find their tribe somewhere. Um, and... Just, just to hear you talk about that, that's, a, that's astounding that you made a list. Um, I, I, oh, like yeah. I love that and I hate that at the same time. Like you made, you made yourself a goal and a list and you put a number on it. Um, and, you know, what an insight into an undiagnosed, you know, autistic girl, which was in effect the stakes, which for most people would be, mm -hmm. oh, well, you know, that's life. The stakes are life or death for you. It's a life mm -hmm. or death stakes of mm -hmm. finding friends, which – in effect means finding acceptance, you know, fitting mm -hmm. in. Um, so the idea of you going through life and making it to high school and literally feeling like you don't fit in, you're not accepted, mm -hmm. you don't know where you're supposed to go, you have no group, you have no thing, it's clearly, you know, it clearly impacted your mental health. But, mm -hmm. you know, can you, can you kind of explain a bit more broadly... In, in those years, how did it affect you holistically? Like it, it affected you, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally, like how bad did it get? Well, of course, right there, I was making a deal with myself, right? <laughs> you know, you need to figure out how to somehow get over this or else. So that was pretty serious. But generally it was, I mean, it was similar in a way to the narcissistic abuse as far as this disconnection with who I really was, where who I was was apparently bad. So I had to figure out how to mold myself with my peers. And so I go home and I'm dealing with one environment and I go outside and then I'm still dealing with this where I have to be someone else and whoever I am is always wrong. So constantly trying to figure that out. And then I find acceptance with one group, but I'm always on the periphery where I'm not quite as cool or whatever. I'm not as well liked as the rest of the group. And eventually I kind of fade out of that group and have to find another group. So it, it, it was very difficult not having that sense of belonging. So so yeah, so I, I think that's where that trauma was in as far as not really knowing who I was, who I was supposed to be, and really just pivoting to the desires or expectations of other people for my whole life. I mean, it's really hard. It wasn't until probably my 30s where I really started to give attention to my own needs and and in my own feelings and think about 
you know, what, what do I feel? How does it feel to feel, you know, labeling my emotions, all those things, because I had been in incredibly disconnected with that and really just floating through life in many ways. Do you think you had a, a childhood that most kids have? Do you feel like you missed out on having a normal childhood? Do you feel like you were treated how most kids should be treated? I mean, it was... If you're referring to my childhood, I don't think it was normal. My narcissistic parent really liked to have really tight control on everything. So I suspect there was a lot of times where maybe I had opportunities to socialize and they decided to keep me in instead. And they also created narratives around things. They made me afraid of people. And really the reason for this is because they didn't want anyone to report them. So for example, I was taught that the, the state or the government or whatever was just eager to take children out of their homes. And so therefore, essentially I needed to be afraid of adults. So once I was a parent, I realized how that was an extremely odd conversation to have. Why would you talk to your child about that, about how the government wants to take your, take children away? But the reason they, this parent, my parent mentioned this, of course, was because things were happening and they didn't want me to talk to people. But as a result, yeah, I was afraid to talk to a lot of people. I drew very much inward. So as far as my home life, no, it wasn't normal. As far as the interactions, so aside from my home life, I don't think it was really that normal either because again, I did whole so inward. I was more interested in books until about my teenage years when I did become more interested in dating and other things and seeing everyone else starting to really grow up and live their lives and realizing that I was stagnant and not knowing how to change that. Something just occurred to me, this is, please don't take this take this badly. I'm, it's a thought starter, I'm saying. Being an autistic person and parenting an autistic child is really hard. I mean, it's like, it's, you can't, it's not something mm -hmm. I can even explain. It's really hard. Uh, and my, my brain's asking you, Karen, to talk, talk me through this. Okay. So would my kid in 10 years call me a narcissist, right? So what I'm saying is, could your narcissistic um, parent, in fact, be an autistic parent on the premise, again, I'm just saying, this is a thought starter, on the premise that yeah. how many times, Karen, do we get called narcissist, autistic people, right? How many times? It's bloody stupid. But, the, and, you know, but the point, I guess the point I'm saying is, um, do, you ever, do you ever think about the irony of your experience and, and how you know, often, you know, autistic people are accused of being narcissists and how, you know, being an autistic person, parenting an autistic child presents or manner of challenges. Am I offending you or am I helping you? I, no. I apologize. No, not at all. And I have thought about that. And actually, the reason the last straw, I guess, in my relationship with my narcissistic parent was when they accused me of being a narcissist. And I could get back to that story in a minute. But yeah, so it doesn't offend me. I understand why people who do not understand narcissism would possibly think that, but it's, it's completely different. There is a, a misconception as to what narcissism is. So when people detect someone has maybe a narcissistic trait, maybe they're self-centered, the assumption is, oh, well, they must be narcissistic. And being narcissistic, there's so much more to it. Not only are there significant amount of traits. It's not just one or two, but it's prolonged, it's persistent, and it occurs over just different situations. So it isn't situational. It's very pervasive throughout their life. So that's one thing. But the other thing about narcissists, it's really about control because they have such a lack of self-esteem and just their sense of self is so poor, they need to be able to control others to be able to satisfy their needs, essentially. It's all about control. So most autistic people, the idea that they can be really controlling or manipulative, that's kind of hard to believe. It's not to say that it can't happen, but 
again, there's a big difference between being a little self-centered, which I could see someone who is autistic being a little self-centered versus a full-blown narcissist who needs that control in order to function. We haven't really got to the diagnosis later in life, but you know, prior to that, how many di- diagnosis you know, uh, <laughs> attempts did you go through? What other things did you genuinely feel you had? You know, how did all this you know, growing, getting into adulthood, how did, yeah. how did all this start to start to snowball? When I was 18, pretty much immediately, as soon as I was able to go to a doctor by myself, and I, I will note, sorry, that's another thing. When I was younger, I rarely went to a doctor. I am asthmatic, and even though I was asthmatic, I just used my parent, my narcissistic parents inhaler. I don't think I was ever formally diagnosed with asthma until I was 18. So that wow. just highlights how much I was removed from being able to seek treatment. So as soon as I turned 18, I did go and try to figure out what was happening. I was diagnosed with anxiety and I was in and out with uh, doctors, psychologists, just trying to understand what was happening because nothing ever really stuck. So again, it was anxiety, it's depression, there was a lot of, oh, well, you know, you kind of had a hard life. So we'd have the, the talk therapy, but nothing really came of it because it always would come back to, oh, well, Karen, you're just look at you. You're so smart. You have all these things. You have everything together. You have this great education, this good job. You're OK. You know, so I would go to every few years, uh, a psychologist, a doctor and they would just kind of kick it, kick the can down the down the curb as far as, oh, well, you know, everything's okay. And I think what really was the, the change was that it was a number of things. So I got a divorce in my mid thirties and the stress of that was starting to produce physical symptoms in the sense of I was starting to develop almost like a movement disorder. I didn't know it at the time, but I was having involuntary movements and I thought, okay, well, this is just stress that progressed. About two years later, I started dating my current partner and with this partner for the first time, I actually had an honest relationship where I could really tell them about everything that had happened in my life. And Unfortunately, good and bad. On one hand, it was good to have that transparency, but the bad thing was that I was finally having to address PTSD, significant PTSD that I had like put, I, I say I put like in little jars up on a high shelf kind of thing. <laughs> and having this relationship, even though I had talked to other partners about some of these things, it was always in a very superficial way. Like, yes, this happened. and. I was picking partners that really didn't care to dig. And now finally I had a person that truly cared about me and wanted to understand these things. And I was actually having to confront them. So now I, I refer to this as like, I'm smashing all these jars and it's all this trauma all at once. And so I was already in a somewhat bad place, the stress of a, a divorce. And now I'm <laughs> addressing a ton of PTSD from five different traumas, so five different uh, incidents or experiences. And it it kind of sent me over the edge and I developed this full-blown movement disorder. Now, I later found out that that movement disorder, it's called a functional neurological disorder. And as part of that, I have a functional movement disorder, but it was due to this untreated trauma and the stress and everything. But so as part of trying to figure out what was happening to me, I went to a psychologist one last time. Again, thinking it was stress, thinking that at this point I was thinking, well, maybe it's borderline personality disorder because I did have so much trauma. I did have trouble in relationships. It kind of seemed to fit. And so I went to a psychologist who specialized in that. Now, what I did not recognize at the time was that she also specialized in autism. So when I saw her, we had several sessions and that last session, 
I went into it. She had already told me, okay, Karen, at this session, I'm, I think I know what's going on. We're going to talk about the diagnosis. So I went into that session knowing she was going to talk about the diagnosis. She literally had like a stack of papers right next to her to tell me about what was happening. You'd think I would be really excited to finally know what was happening. And instead, I just started complaining about something that was going on at work and how I was frustrated. And it was in this because she kept trying to steer me back to why we were there as far as getting the diagnosis and tried to give me perspective on why I was frustrated with my coworker and all these things. And I wasn't picking up on it. And it was in this that she just had to stop me. He's like, wait, Karen, I know what this is. You know, I was right about to diagnose you with borderline personality disorder, but that's not what this is. You're autistic. So that's how I ended up with my diagnosis and a lot of it had to do the getting there had to do with trying to understand my PTSD and addressing that. That's an incredible, um, an incredible experience and story. I appreciate you mm -hmm. sharing it. Like, it's impossible to break down. The first thing I want to say is, so hang on a second. And you're saying you, you got married, had a marriage and were divorced undiagnosed. Is that right? Correct. What, what a mind blowing experience. Um, and don't don't you think there's like I, I was married undiagnosed don't you think there's so many late diagnosed you know, autistic people that that got into a relationship or into a marriage um prior to discovering it um mm -hmm. and may never get the opportunity like for example my having a kid helped me right so my, i still have mm -hmm. the same marriage and the same family but you know it, you you must have you know, insights from your point of view, obviously, because we have very different experiences, how how like that must almost start to become a bit of a prison for a lot of undiagnosed autistic women. I guess they it must be quite um, it must be quite a challenging experience, you know, going through marriages or relationships undiagnosed or not knowing if you'll ever get there. I mean, you were in the room; she was going to diagnose with something wrong <laughs> before she. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. I mean, I guess I didn't know what was wrong though because. Everyone had blown me off and told me that, oh, again, no, you're just a little depressed or you're anxious or this or that. And they kept dismissing me. So I just assumed that what I was experiencing was normal and that everyone had their challenges. I have my challenges and that it wasn't that much different than what other people went through. So that that was the big thing. I just assumed everyone have has their problems. Now, one thing when I was in my marriage, and I, I don't want to talk about my marriage too much, but there was a conversation where autism came up. And the reason autism came up was this is when I was still in touch with my narcissistic parent and I had been visiting and they dismissively said, oh, well, I just think you're autistic. I always have or something like that. And I was in my 20s, I think, when this happened. And so I sat on that a little bit. And so I had talked to my my I believe we were married at that point. But I said, well, you know, does this sound right? And he was like, oh, well, no, you're, you're definitely not autistic. Actually, he accused me of being attention seeking. So for me at that point, it's like, okay, well, I must not be autistic. All right, well, just move on. And again, it must be due to all these other challenges that I've experienced. So yeah. I, yeah. But I, I will say though, that being, having that perspective is huge because it, can steer your decision making. I think I would have made very different decisions, not only with relationships, but even with my career. There's so many things I would have done differently had I known I was autistic. And it wasn't simply an issue of learning how to deal with certain situations or something that I could overcome. That was one of the most traumatic things about being diagnosed was that for my whole life, I thought my struggles were something I could overcome if I kept trying hard enough and finally realizing I can't overcome this. And it's not bad that I'm autistic. That was another thing because it's like I couldn't get mad about being autistic because there's a lot of really great things about who I am that are directly related to being autistic. So I'm frustrated with it, but I can't be too mad 
because there's things I love about it too, right? So that yeah. was really traumatic in itself when I got my diagnosis and really not knowing how to move forward. Which I really reckon people will resonate with the idea that your life, I'm talking about like everyone, but myself, like your life pre-diagnosis can be so bad and feel so bad. And then if you actually are lucky enough to get a diagnosis, instead of thinking, you know, it's a new life, you actually are quite resentful and mm -hmm. there's, there's guilt and there's, it's like the grieving process. You get angry, mm -hmm. you go through all the steps. Like you said yourself, you want a time machine. You're like, I can't go back and fix all these broken things. I, I can't go back to that workplace and go, oh, actually I'm autistic. Oh, come back. Like they're not going to do that. They don't care that I'm autistic. Yeah. That, that's something that, that's a really resonating experience you're talking about. The idea that you know, your life can be quite bad pre, but then when you get this kind of new beginning, the first, the pl first place you go to is kind of resentment and anger and grief. Like, is that something mm -hmm. you un you can un understand? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think when I first was diagnosed, the first thing was, oh my gosh, finally, I finally have an answer. I was actually really happy when I first found out I was autistic. It was like, finally, this is great. And then the next step was forgiving myself because for so long I had been so hard on myself with the whole, oh, well, you just need to try harder. What's wrong with you? You know, you need to figure yourself out. So there was a lot of self-hatred and loathing and all that. So I forgave myself and I told myself, okay, well, I don't, I'm not going to do that to you anymore. I, I, I apologize. I said, I'm sorry I did that. And, and I also forgave myself for that behavior and I decided I wanted to move on. So that happened really quickly with him. Like it happened in the parking lot of, of my psychologist's like office right after I got diagnosed. But then what happened was the realization where, okay, I want to be open now because this is good. Finally, I understand myself. And if I could have conversations with other people and explain to them what's happening, maybe things will be better. And I immediately found out that I could not have those conversations. And so then I was really resentful because it's like, it's one thing when you don't know, but now I know. And people want me to act like I used to. And they don't want to understand this aspect of me. Not only that, but they're judging me. It was amazing. I had conversations with people I knew for years. And as soon as I told them I was autistic, like I could literally see like their opinion of my IQ was just like, you know, dropping, you know, and all of a sudden they're speaking slower. They're just treating me differently. They're over explaining things. And so that was a really difficult space to exist in. Because again, I recognize there was a lot of really good things about being autistic. I love my autistic mind. Yeah, it causes a lot of problems too that are frustrating, but I love the way I think, you know? And so to have people make me feel like that is something I have to hide. Um, I was even told, oh, well, you do such a great job. Why don't you just keep trying a little harder? You know, that, that was really hard. So I was really depressed for about two years following my diagnosis. How did you get out of it? How did you get yourself out of that? Because I, I can t completely relate to the idea. Everything, everything you just said, I can completely understand and, and relate to wholeheartedly. You know, you're not competent anymore overnight because you've got a diagnosis. How does it affect my mm -hmm. competency, a diagnosis? It makes no sense. But how do, how do you – because I, I understand – I personally think a lot of these issues could be much harder s socially as a woman – uh, and certainly in relationships and, you know, jobs and things. And how, how did you get yourself out of that? It was somewhat forced upon me. So initially I felt like I had to just hold it together, push it aside. Okay, I'm going to act like I'm not autistic or I'm going to heavily mask because it's apparently inconvenient to people and I need an income. And so I did that, but I was very resentful. I did become disengaged. Now, during this time, just the nature of what I do professionally, at least what I was doing professionally at the time, it was very impacted by the pandemic. So that started to cause me to look into new avenues for income, right? New avenues for employment. And as I started to do that, I became a bit more empowered about identifying as autistic and embracing that and getting more frustrated about having to be put back into that box of you know not being autistic 
it has been a struggle. There was one point where I was very open publicly. And then when I got a new job, all of a sudden I had to retract everything because I was so afraid of, well, what if the employer finds out? And now obviously I have this channel. I am a little more open, but it is nerve wracking knowing that certain employers would not hire me because I'm autistic. So I target companies that have a, a good culture and where I think I would thrive in that situation. But those employers can be few and far between. Not every employer is like that. Mm. So I guess all that to say it's been a process and a lot of the reason I've been hesitant has to do with my career. If I did not have to worry about my career, if money was no object, I would have been open from day one. That's you know obviously very relatable for a late diagnosed because a lot of us have had careers, we've done well, mm -hmm. um, and then it's all just fallen in a heap as it, as it would with autistic adults undiagnosed. And then we get diagnosed and then the issue comes down to, are we going to try and you know um, make something of that or are we going to disclose it or are we going to act like nothing happened? Uh, and which, which is, is helpful, but not is helpful to others, but not to yourself. But I, mm. I think we can't underestimate right now in modern, in the modern day world, having an autism diagnosis will kill just about every opportunity there is in life. It will kill relationship mm. opportunities, it will kill friendship opportunities, it will kill employment opportunities. Uh, and, and just how do you navigate that? Like just, I mean, I know that's a lot of yeah. stuff you do on your channel, but just like the idea that automatically, oh, okay, so you're not competent anymore or, you know, you, you have challenges or issues that we can't deal with. Just the idea of disclosing that you're autistic mm -hmm. can, in effect, like today in this modern day world, can, in effect, ruin your chances of really mm -hmm. achieving anything in life in the outside world unless you mm -hmm. do it all yourself. I mean, that it's an astounding realisation and it's an astounding hurdle to get over, but it's true. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And that, that was part of the reason I was so depressed, right? For I was struggling for those two years because I did not know how to process all that. Where is my space to exist? And how could people who I really respected and I valued and I had friendships with, how could they just disregard me simply because I'm autistic. I didn't change. I was still autistic prior to my diagnosis. They just didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. But yeah, that was really, really hard to grapple with. And I still deal with that. Even though I'm more open, I I still deal with people who don't quite, in, in my life, who don't quite understand the autistic experience. And they care about me and all that. But they still can be a bit dismissive. It still seems kind of like a us against them kind of thing where, you know, we're a bit lesser. And I hope we can get to a place in the near future where it's more equal. And this is the, this is the issue. Like, and in fact, ironically, I, I'm not personally a massive fan of April. Um, because of the autism mm -hmm. awareness campaigns that happen. I know people think they're great, but it's it's not something I, I especially like. In fact, I find it probably the most depressing, draining month of the year. I just kind of blink and hope it goes away. But I will say this. So the UN, who who established the International Day, basically, they, they dictate what they class as the theme for each year, yeah? And the, year, the theme this year, the UN have decided, um, I'm not going to go into the full title, but it's basically from, from surviving to thriving. Now... I will say that's a bloody great topic. Um, I actually think <laughs> yeah. well done to the team that put that together because the UN have a lot of great organisations that help them, um, autistic people. And, that, and, that, and that's exactly what you've just said. Like that, that's the topic for the month of April is exactly what you've just said. Um, autistic people are only surviving. And here's the thing that this is, you know, in my mind, I, I, this is kind of funny but because it's so sad. In 2024, in April 2024, we're going to talk about how autistic people are only surviving in life and thriving is a dream <laughs> for autistic people to thrive. The UN, that is, the United Nations is saying in 2024, autistic people across the world only survive and it's a dream of ours and we're going to get people to talk about it that one day maybe we'll get to thrive. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh yeah, it's ridiculous. And a lot of it has to do, especially if we're talking, well, there's a lot of 
things at play, but a big one is our access to employment and changing perceptions about not only what it means to be autistic, but the workplace culture and challenging that a bit where right now, so for example, I'm applying for jobs right now and I look into advice on interviewing and things like that. Now I know how to interview. I, it's, it's not really anything I haven't heard, but I'm still seeing very recent articles and uh, watching YouTube channels on, on advice and stuff. And they're talking about, oh, well, you must know how to make eye contact. You must know how to do these certain things if you want to get through the interview. And there's also the issue where they talk about, oh, well, if you're autistic and they typically term it as neurodivergent because I guess autistic is a bad word. I don't know. So if you are neurodivergent and you might have challenges, just try to get through the interview and then tell them that that's the, the common advice that I'm seeing all over the place right now in 2024. And so to change this, we need to start having conversations where people with I hate to say other disabilities because I view autism, it's an identity and a disability, but I wouldn't expect someone else with a disability to somehow have to hide and pretend they don't have a disability until they get a job. Or in some ways, I almost view, I view certain aspects of masking like speaking a second language. When we're masking our communication style, it's almost like, in, like we're speaking neurotypical. It's not our, our native, our intuitive you know, language. And if you were interviewing someone where they were speaking their second language, I would hope it would be okay for them to say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm from wherever, uh, especially, you know, you wouldn't expect them to hide their accent or anything like that. But for us, it's almost like we have to do that. We can't even have that candid conversation of, oh, well, yeah, we might communicate slightly differently. And it's just because we're autistic, you know, we should be able to have that just like someone who's coming from a different country might say, oh, well, I might have different phrases and my accent might be a little heavy. Let me know what I need to repeat myself. It's the same thing, yet we can't have that conversation. And that's, a big problem so yeah yeah oh man Karen, I, it, it, yeah. it's so much it's yeah. but it starts in the workplace yeah you're uh you're spitting fire my friend you're on <laughs> fire that is i'm not i can't even tell you how crazy good uh you, you made me about two or three youtube shorts in the space of three minutes thank you no but seriously <laughs> can i can i just say like this is legit you need to put this on your channel as quickly as possible that exact analogy of the languages. Put that on your channel as quickly as possible because it's gold. Okay, so the idea that I could say to an employer, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm from the planet Autistica and we have different customs and a language and I'm doing my best to understand your customs and your language, um, so please bear with me. And I, you know, like, if we could say that, like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm, you know, I'm from France. Uh, English is my second language. Please bear with me. I'm so sorry. I'm doing my best. You'd go, oh, that's okay. No worries. I mean, because automatically you go, holy shit, they're smarter than me. They can speak two languages, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, fir the first thing I think, I don't care if you are a cleaner or the president, if you can speak two languages, you're smarter than me. I automatically think that. Like, I give them credit, man. Like, props to you, dude. Well done. But the idea that we could say, you know, hi, I'm, a, I'm from, you know, the planet Autistic Era, and you know, I'm, we, have, we don't have this, these customs. We don't speak this language where I'm from. I'm doing my best. I can't go. That planet's dead, man. I can't go back there. <laughs> but I'm doing my best. You know, imagine if we could do that. We can't do that. But it's a bloody great analogy and it actually shows the idea that, you know, it's, it's actually, it, it's almost like there's a bizarro world. It's like, hang on, how come you guys are happy to help other people but when it's us and it's not something my brain can even get around? Yeah, because they view us as lesser. That's the thing. We're, we're, we're lesser. And so it's hard to relate to that. I mean, honestly, that's what it is. But yeah, so as far as the surviving and thriving, to get us to thriving, we need to address the employment issue. That's the big one. And again, that goes back to workplace culture, because if we have jobs and not only just any just garbage job that they want to throw at us, but legitimate, like good jobs where we are getting satisfaction in what we're doing and we are gainfully employed. We're not underemployed or anything like that. That will 
drastically change the trajectory for our whole life. It will definitely impact our mental health, all those things. So it all starts with equal access to employment and not being discriminated against and not being assumed that we're less capable simply because we're autistic. And that was one of the biggest challenges I had when I was in the workplace and every workplace really, but especially in the, especially most recently where I was a consultant, a very highly paid consultant where I was being brought in for my ideas. They loved my ideas. They loved that I thought differently and I could solve things that no one else could. So, you know, it was my autistic brain. Obviously they didn't know that, but they loved my autistic brain, but they didn't want to know that it was about autism, right? So that's the challenge there yeah. where employers recognize that there is value for with autistic employees with autistic yeah. individuals, but they don't want to associate it with autism. It's just, oh, that person happens to be gifted. It's not because they're autistic, you know, so. Yeah, it's a hundred percent right. You know what? It's like, um, they want the gold. They just don't know, don't want to know where it came from. Or they want that. They mm -hmm. want the diamond ring. They just don't, mm -hmm. don't tell me what, where you got this diamond from. I don't want to know the stories, but I'm happy to have this ring. It's like, it's the same premise. They, you know, mm -hmm. they, they want that result. This is the thing. They want to mine the, the diverse, the neurodiversity. They they want to mine the difference in how mm -hmm. we can provide you know provide them different things, but they don't want to do anything for taking that from us. That's the thing. Like, that as long as you can go back to the office now and be neurotypical, we're fine. Mm -hmm. But it's not like you produced neurotypical results. You didn't. You produced autistic results, but we mm -hmm. don't want that. And and this is and everything you've said. I hope people people need to hear everything everything you've said because in my opinion. This is the key and core issue for autistic people going forward because we all become adults and we all need mm. jobs and money, right? We don't need to be rich, but we need money to live. <laughs> and we all, and, and you can, it's not easy to get jobs if you're going to disclose and be an autistic person. And this is why I agree with you. It comes down to culture, but here's the problem. Culture in the mainstream workplace is free food, pinball machines, and going out to the bowling alley for a team meet on a Friday and having alcohol mm. or something. That's not culture. Culture is about how you treat your people. You know, that's, that's culture. And in, in the end, it has to come down to how are we going to treat autistic employees? And at the moment, the gatekeepers stop us from getting in at the interview stage. You know, if we get in, mm -hmm. HR get us out pretty quick. So the, every phase is against us. So it, it, it's almost overwhelming for me to even understand that my son will have it better than me. Yeah. And that's actually thinking of our children. That is actually why I finally decided to create my channel in that I have an autistic child as well. And after I received well, my diagnosis and then they received their diagnosis after me were a little reversed. A lot of times late diagnosed, they come after their children. But for me, I came first and then I had to push really hard to get their diagnosis because the same thing was happening. Oh no, they're, they're not autistic. They're just so smart, you know, all that. And once they finally got that diagnosis and I was looking at them and I was thinking of everything I've dealt with and I just thought, no, this isn't okay. It's one thing that I have experienced this. I'm older. This is my life. I could accept that this has been my life, my experience, but this is not okay for my child and I have to change it. And so that's why I decided to start this channel, at least one of the big reasons, because things have to change. This is not okay where we are right now. It's not acceptable. And yeah, our children deserve better. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think in the, the whole employment, whole employment sector um, is such a fascinating topic for autistic people and uh, you know videos like yourself I, I always get worked up and passionate I actually love talking about it it's I think it's so good and I think videos like like yourself and your experience is is, is core to that you know that going forward um, uh, and I'm, I'm so uh, grateful that you you do that and I, th it, I think this is a thing about autistic people how can you label us narcissists you know like we, we try to help people by putting ourselves out there and ruining our own lives and possibilities of employment to help our kids. 
Oh, that's the rever- isn't that the reverse? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, seriously. That we even identify that we recognize we're autistic. I doubt a truly nar- narcissistic person yeah. would recognize that, right? Because it's all about that facade and and yeah. and managing public perception. Yeah, it's totally not compatible. Yeah. I've re- this has been an amazing chat, and I've really enjoyed it, and I really love the insights you've given. Um, this is my this is just me telling you. This is your last opportunity now before I say goodbye for you to say anything that is important for you to say or is on your chest or you want to say to autistic women or other ones. So this is me telling you, Karen, this is your last chance to say whatever you want to say. No, I, I think it's just important that we learn to embrace who we are. There's nothing wrong with being autistic. And again, there's a lot of good things about being autistic. And we just need to learn how to advocate for ourselves as a community and and build a a movement even. Maybe learning from other minority groups who are ahead of us as far as how we could get some traction on this and and move forward, right? So that we're no longer just uh, struggling, however you put it, with the UN, right? And we could finally get to that point where we're truly thriving, so. 100%. Uh, hey, Karen, thanks so much for hanging out. It's been great hanging I hope you've enjoyed it too. Yes, absolutely. And hopefully we'll uh, catch up again soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, so clearly you're a fan of the collaboration. Then check out the playlist, an entire playlist of collaborations with some of the best and brightest autistic content creators on the planet.